In our third session, to which I would like to welcome you warmly, we will once again discuss digitization and data management. Last time, we already established that digitization does not simply mean scanning, but that all data must be enriched in order to be machine-readable. This applies not only to texts, but also to images, which we want to deal with today. Over the last 30 or 40 years, the appearance of the digital has changed considerably. To put it briefly, it has become more pictorial. A milestone was reached in the mid-80s when the user interfaces of the operating systems still in use today became graphical. The graphical interface now became the user's access to data that was not visible to him. It enabled him to operate application software on a computer by means of graphic symbols and control elements. The design of today's graphic interfaces often uses the metaphor of an office with folders, windows and waste paper baskets. This concept became popular in 1984 with Apple's Macintosh and Microsoft even adopted it in the name of its operating system shortly afterwards. This not only made the surface pictorial, but also translated the complex processes in the computer into generally understandable images. And what a development has taken place since then. Today you can bring the entire visual world onto the screen and interact with it. Passive consumption, which was for a long time a characteristic of mass media such as radio and television, is now a thing of the past. The user interacts with the computer and the users interact with each other in social media. The basis of this communication is a new aesthetic form of mediality. The interface that makes movement in data space possible for all people. And, significant, and significantly, this happens primarily visually. Looking at the appearance of websites, the change in communication towards pictorial forms is just as clear. The relationship between text and image has shifted extremely in favor of the image, even in traditional daily newspapers, such as the Telegraph, whose articles should actually be the main focus of attention. In short, images have never been as present as they are today. In addition to recognized works of art, Technical images, scientific graphics and photos are at least as important in social media. The omnipresence of images on television and the internet, the increasing visualization in the natural science and imaging techniques in medicine have given images an unprecedented presence and significance that no one can escape. Expect. In the 1990s, this phenomenon was referred to as the iconic turn and called for a more intensive examination of the concept and use of images in all its facets. But the change began much earlier. As is well known, the invention of letterpress printing represents an epochal turn point. Pictures, which until then had always been individual works, could now be distributed en masse. The communicative possibilities associated with this were intensively used, at latest during the period of Reformation and Counter-Reformation, to illustrate the respective beliefs of the correct doctrine. It had already established itself as a propaganda medium with the invention of copperplate engravings, which now knew no bounds to reproduction in unknown fineness and on almost indestructible printing plate. But this is also raised but this also raised the question of the original work at art anew. Was the printing block the original, or were there now countless originals? A question that now became even more virulent through photography. Even through the first photographs were composed in a similar way to printings and paintings, the character of the image changed fundamentally. Now it was possible to take supposedly objective pictures of reality and reproduce them as desired. All these methods, however, had a starting point for reproduction with printing plate and negative. Without them there was no reproduction, but even this last specific feature of the traditional image is abolished in the digital. With digital photography, the originals could be copied and distributed loss-free from any copy, so that pictorial social communication could now spread explosively throughout the world. 
But this has also changed the nature of communication significantly because pictures do not proceed argumentatively but present visual statements. Renate Brosch puts it in a nutshell. For example, the computer tomography of a wood fiber reinforced injection molding component, which you can see in the right hand side of the picture, quickly illustrates complex measurements such as here the proportion of fibers in volume percent. However, the color distribution is not predetermined, but already a suggestion for interpretation. This obvious evidence of the images therefore requires interpretation by the viewer, who can only contextualize and understand them within the respective frame of reference. However, this context is fluid and can be recreated again and again, for example in social networks such as Instagram, by copying and distributing the images. Or, as Renato Brosch has put it, in general, images cannot be true or false because they don't have no unequal vocal predicate to which truth or falsehood can be related. Images produce evidence. According to Margarete Pratschke, the flood of images in the media world surrounding us is encountered by an ebb and flow in the scientific examination of images. Thus, in contrast to the supposed decanonization effects associated with digitization, artistry projects usually show a more far-reaching narrowing of the art canon, which initially and certainly also due to the digitization of slide libraries concentrated on the works of recognized artists in their digital acquisition strategies. You know the projects on Leonardo and Van Gogh. And the major museums are understandably taking a similar approach and started putting their highlights on the Internet. Similarly, archaeologists first of all visualized Athens and Rome in 3D models, whereby the digital models were often not based on the latest excavation results, but in the case of Rome, on the model of Gismondi from the 1940s. Another highly controversial form of image ebbing, which is highly controversial in terms of scientific science policy can be observed in digital publications where the research objects cannot be shown due to image restrictions. Image not available online, it says then. This fundamentally restricts the image sciences and deprives them from the advantages of the canon that has always been demanded since the discussion about the iconic turn. This can only be countered by continuing to make great efforts to digitize collections, to make digitized material freely available, to standardize acquisition processes, to network image files and metadata worldwide, and of course to provide appropriate financial support. As IBM has already shown in the 1990s, digital images are also, a commercial, are also of commercial importance. Do the individual museums still have a chance at all in a market dominated by players like Google or Getty Getty Images? For this reason, a critical examination of the economic aspects of digital images also seems to be necessary, but I, we cannot deepen the topic here. Today, we want to discuss the digital image in three approaches. From code to image deals with the technical aspects scanning, the peculiarities of image processing, image editing and image storage. The second part then deals with the theory of the digital image. What actually is a digital image and what are its characteristics? And thirdly, we ask the question of the advantages of text and image-oriented digital acquisition of images. So let us start with the technical aspects of the digital image. While book scanners, as here the Göttingen Digitization Center of the SUB, work with digital cameras to protect the book spines, flatbed scanners are used for the digitization of images. The documents to be scanned are placed face down on a glass plate. A combined lightning and scanning unit moves in a flat bed under the glass plate, similar to the scanning unit in a digital photocopier. An image can therefore only be captured by the detector because of the light reflected from it. Transparent images such as photo negatives, film strips or slides require special accessories that illuminate them from the top. Digital cameras can be used for the same purposes as image scanners. 
Compared to a real scanner, a camera image is subject to a certain degree of distortion, reflections, shadows, low contrasts and blur due to the camera shake, which can be reduced on cameras with image stabilization. The resolution is sufficient for less demanding applications. Digital cameras, on the other hand, offer the advantages of speed, portability and non-contact digitization of thick documents. To achieve optimal results, it is important to know the physical resolution of the scanner. For standard desktop scanners, it is usually 600 dpe, although manufacturers are happy to quote much higher figures. However, this is usually only interpolated that is processed by software. On the screen, everything, be it text, numbers or mathematical symbols, notes or photos, is seen as an image because everything has to be broken down into pixels to be displayed. This was not much different in printing. Printed images consist of a collection of individual, very fine print dots, which are only mixed together in the eye to form a raster-free image. As a measure of the spatial print, video or image scanner dot density, DPI, or dots per inch, refers to a number of individual dots contained in a line within an area of one inch. Monitors do not have dots, but pixels do. The closely related concept for monitors and images is pixels per inch, or PPI. On the left you see the rasterized version of the print, and on the right the pixelated version of the monitor images. A bitmap image or raster graphic consists of individual pixels. In coding, each pixel is determined from three values, its position, its color value and its brightness. If you enlarge such graphics strongly, such scare case effects are created. Even continuous lines are only accumulations of dots in the scaling. For line graphics, a different coding is therefore more suitable, namely the description by vectors. These vector graphics consist of single lines and can be scaled without loss of quality. For large, geometrically structured templates, even relatively small files can be created. However, the color information refers to the respective vectors and the areas formed by them. Graduated color transitions are not so easily possible then. By means of appropriate calculation processes, which every image processing application provides, bitmap graphics can be converted into vector graphics that is vectorized, and vice versa, vector graphics can be rendered. As we have already seen, images are rasterized differently for presentation in print than on the screen. A moiré effect that can therefore easily occur during scanning, namely when the amplitude modulated raster is transferred from differently sized pixels, as used in printing, to a frequency modulated raster. This effect can no longer be reduced without loss after scanning, so it is advisable to use the relatively good screening algorithms in the relevant scanner software when scanning in images. Raster screens are used as output devices for the digital image, with display the image as a raster of pixels, each of which is assigned a color value. Image size is defined as width times height in pixels, for example 600 to 900 pixels. Monitors usually have a resolution of 72 pixels per inch, although newer ones have a much higher resolution. For printing, 300 dpi dots per inch is usually used. Many monitor drivers try to avoid the negative effect of hard edges bitmaps usually have by using dithering for the display. This is a visual aid or simulation for color optimization and scaling. You can observe it well on the umbrella of the right. The pixel graphic actually has a very small image size. But here, the low resolution that is connected with it is overridden by simulation of non-existent colors by showing a mixture of neighboring colors. The dithering method chosen here is called diffusion. It arranges the pixels according to a random pattern. 
A pixel in a black and white graphic needs exactly one bit. If the bit is one, the pixel becomes black. If it is zero, it remains white. An image with an image size of 100 times 100 pixels consists of 100 times 100 times 1 bit, that is 10,000 bits or 1,250 bytes, which is 1.22 kilobytes. Accordingly, two bits are needed for four gradations, four bits for 16 and eight bits for 256. This is also the usual color depth of grayscale images, and also here the actual file size can be calculated analogously. At a color depth of 8 bits, that is 256 colors, the following applies. 100 times 100 times 8 bits are 80,000 bits, are 10,000 bytes, or 9.76 kilobytes. Color depth Two, uh, 25, 24 bits means 60,077,260 colors, 100 times 100 times 24 bits, or 240,000 bits, 30,000 bytes, 29.3 kilobytes. A table on the right clearly shows the relationship between color depth and file size. The color depth is in bits thus defines the number of colors per pixel. The appearance of the colors also depends on the output medium, display or print. This is because a different color space exists here. In the physiological color mixing of the monitor or television, all colors of the color circ all colors of the color circle are created by mixing the light, that is the wavelength of the three primary colors red, green and blue are added or su superimposed on each other. Because red, green, blue, the color space is also called RGB color space. Physical color mixing uses a generative color model that describes the technical mixing ratios of its four primary colors. It, de it describes the change of a color stimulus when reflected on the surface of a body. With the help of the three color filters, cyan, magenta and yellow, connected in series, colors are not mixed, but a change in the light spectrum takes place as a result of which only changed colors are seen. However, the way colors are displayed on the monitor does not quite correspond to human perception because the color space of the human eye, shown as a colored parabolic area in the graphic on the right, is larger than on the screen display RGB. In the meantime, however, the development of the original sRGB color space through color match and Adobe RGB to Pro Photo RGB has come very close to the human eye. In print, that is in the CM, CMYK color space, however, not even half of the colors can be displayed. A scanned image, therefore, often looks different on screen than it does in print. Image files, as we saw, become very large. When an image file is compressed, clusters of several pixels are formed, which then only have to be saved once as a set and referenced each time they occur. With very high compression, several similarly structured clusters are also combined, which is why loss-free compression is no longer possible. Unlike the LZW compression of the file format TIFF, JPEG is such an efficient but lossy compression. You can see it clearly in the right-hand section where, for example, clear clusters in the form of squares can be seen below the lip, for example. Such artifacts are typical for high compression in JPEG format. The JPEG artifacts are not the only problems when dealing with digitized images. I already mentioned the Moiré effect. Besides that, there are a lot of other image errors, which I will not go into today. I would just like to mention that in most image processing applications, the automatic batch processing is available for recurring process steps. This allows you to automate the change of size, format or resolution, and to perform it all at once when a selection of images has been made. Tags and metadata can also be added or replaced automatically. And finally, an overview of the most common file format for images. 
Scalable vector graphic format saves the image as a vector graphic, as the name says. It is scalable, which is why compression is not necessary. The maximum number of colors here is only 24, which is sufficient for line graphics. SVG is therefore mainly used for printing line graphics. The other formats listed here, Safe Pixel Graphics, PNG, Portable Network Graphics Format, has the highest, highest color depth and can also be saved as images in layers and transparently, which is why it's namely used on websites that define the background in HTML code. Compression is lossy in this format. JPEG, or Joint Photographic Expert Group, is the format of choice when saving images for screen display because of its efficient, l lossy compression. This also plays to GIFs, whose color depth can be reduced and which also allows animations, that is film-like playing of image sequences. TIFF, on the other hand, is best suited for pre-press. It enables loss-free compression and the saving of several layers. The second part will now deal with the properties of the digital image. We have been talking about images and image data for a while now, without having defined exactly what an image actually is. In the first lesson, we had emphasized that image sciences use an extended concept of the image, which includes all historical and media forms of the image, namely two-dimensional pictures and graphics, plastic images and artifacts, photographs, electronic and digital images, as well as virtual spaces. Image studies goes beyond analog and virtual images and also explores immaterial images and ideas. Thus, we have used a number of examples to outline what an image can be. For a definition of the phenomenon is difficult and controversial. A widespread definition comes from Gottfried Böhm. What we encounter as an image is based on a single basic contrast, that between a manageable total area and all that is included in terms of internal events. The relationship between the vivid whole and what it contains in terms of individual determinations of color, form, figure, etc. has been optimized in some way by the artist. In short, it is a two-dimensional phenomenon with artistically designed individual determinations. But to what extent does this definition also apply to the digital image? If one takes a look at the creation of a digital image, it is by no means clear what exactly is the stage of image manifestation in this process. In other words, at what point should one speak of an image? From a motive, in this case a tulip, an image is transferred to the image sensor by means of a lens in mirror image which actually only measures the incidence of light. The result of the measurement is only converted into pixels by image processing and saved on a storage medium. For the human eye, however, the digitally generated image is only visible on the camera display. As a rule, at least professional digital cameras store the image information uncompressed in raw format, which is then converted on the PC with the aid of an image processing program into a format that can be displayed and printed on all systems. So the question arises here, what exactly is the digital image? The signal captured by the light sensor? The image transformed into pixels in its processed or stored form? Or does a digital image only exist as such when it can be seen by the human eye? And when exactly is this the case? The display, as a graphical user interface, forms the front end, the receptive surface on which the contents called up from the back end. That is, the invisible interior of the data world are made visible. Digital images can therefore only be visualized as images by means of imaging techniques. The digital image is actually only now in existence. So if we define image as a visual phenomenon, which is not necessarily the case with images in the mind, we must agree with media scientist Klaus Piers, who has put forward this thesis that digital image does not exist at all. For him, there is something that uses information-giving methods to produce data, and there is something that uses imaging methods to produce images. Both phenomena are decoupled from each other and completely heterogeneous. 
This conclusion is only correct, however, if there is in fact no connection between coded information and its visual implementation on the screen. In current image practice, however, this is not the case. Jens Schröter therefore attempts to define the image, the digital image, as a pictorial phenomenon with concrete characteristics generated by digital code. And Hart Klinkler goes one step further and speaks in general terms of visual information, which can be visualized on a display or printer, modified with image processing software, and distributed by email, internet, computer games, and so on. Following Harald Klinke, we would like to define a universal concept of images. The picture as a visual phenomenon then consists of light information on a picture medium. In the case of a painting, it is color information in bound pigments on a picture carrier made of wood, canvas or other material. The photo consists of brightness information in silver nitrate molecules which are reproduced on an image carrier, usually silver gelatine on paper. And the digital image comprises color information in bits for output on a display with variable brightness values of the RGB subpixels. If we link this distinction to the traditional art historical approach to images, we obtain a model consisting of seven layers, which we have to imagine as an onion in terms of hermeneutic penetration, where we first penetrate to the center layer by layer. But how is the information structured? That depends very much on the file format. Each saves the position, color value and brightness of the pixel in a different coding. The most common file formats you should know are in the field of raster graphics BMP, DNG, GIF, JPEG, PNG, Photocrops, Photoshops, PSD, RAW and TIFF. Vector graphics are usually saved in Adobe Illustrator, Encapsulated Postscript, VMF or EMF formats. If you want to know more about this, you can get a good overview and commented lists of file formats in the Wikipedia article Image File Formats. Besides the pure code, an image file also contains metadata. Besides automatically generated information about the file format, the file size, the file path, or the date of creation and modification, camera data like exposure time, aperture, etc. can also be stored here. Text fields are also available for describing the image content. Jens Schröter had defined the digital image as a pictorial phenomenon with concrete characteristics, created with digital code. These properties include the granularity and addressability. The granularity of data is the number or depth of subdivisions when they are captured. The information can be fine granular in many pixels or coarse granular in a low resolution with a few pixels. For example, the color depth and dot density of the scanner, digital camera or monitor determine the appearance of the digital image. Each, each pixel can be addressed exactly and this with a mathematical precision that is not possible with language. This addressability is also given in image processing with a gradation curve where the pixels can be selected and processed independently of each other and with tonal value accuracy in the tonal value range between 0 and 255. Thus the examination of the image is freed from the textual description where the image was often only an illustration and gets its own instance which can now be examined in the smallest detail. For image science, this means that the analysis of images can now be measured and processed digitally as well as linguist linguistically and textually. Another special feature that the image processing programs have in store for the digital image is working with transparency and layers. The idea originates from any motion film production and individual parts of the image are also visualized on different levels of the image file. The digital image therefore consists not only of individual pixels, but also of layers on which the pixels are grouped together and sometimes in competing versions. The digital image can be manipulated in a targeted manner. Color corrections and falsifications are possible without leaving traces. The visual has developed more and more from the depictive to the constructed. This has far-reaching consequences for the way we act in social discourses. For believing in the age of deep fakes, 
that is images and videos created with deep learning methods that want to make us believe convincingly that what is shown is a real existing document. Famous is a video sequence published in 2018 in which Barack Obama looks seriously into the camera and says, a new age is dawning, in which our enemies can make it look as if all sorts of people are saying all sorts of things, even things they would never actually say. Only that these words have been put into his mouth literally by Jordan Peele. If Russian state television brings a smile to King Jong Un's face when he meets Lavrov, it is an illustrative change of the basic message and is perhaps still acceptable. However, when manipulated images are used as a basis for military actions or population groups are delivered, deliberately influenced by such fake news, digitally manipulated images can shake the foundations of social and political life. Fortunately, knowledge of this characteristic of the digital image is so widespread that it can now be treated ironically in social media. And in this use of the word digital, there is now also always a sense that something is not real, that it is a fake. However, this manipulability not only accommodates self-representation, but also the image scientific way of working, in that it turns the digital image into an experimental medium that can be reconfigured in many ways, restores past states, simulates hypothetical and perhaps even preforms the future. This variability and processability of the digital image can thus certainly be seen as an advantage, which on the other hand of course also lies in the fact that it is possible to make loss-free copies. The digital image differs fundamentally from its analog counterpart in that the visual information is separated from its material appearance. For Marika Hooting, digital images are therefore only mosaics of particles. The essence of digital technology is that it breaks everything down into a collection of point elements. In order for a digital image to be seen, it must therefore be recalculated. Zero-dimensional points must be converted into an image. The digital image is therefore never static but always in motion and reacts to each of our movements. It flows across the screen 60 times per second, varies depending on the hardware, software or internet connection used and reacts to our input. It is basically malleable, co reconfigurable and fluid. Since the digital image can be rendered anywhere and at any time, it exists only in the moment. Thus, the constant new generation of images ultimately change the overall picture. In this understanding, images, as well as the facts clarified by them, are situa situational and thus often fluid, dynamic and unstable. Fluidity Performativity and reconfiguration are therefore important concepts of the digital because the digital image is always only a temporal manifestation and virtual reconfiguration of information. Another important characteristic of the digital image is its ubiquity or, for lack of materiality that binds objects locally, it is simultaneously present and globally available as a code. As a result, the digital image stored in databases and repositories, is comprehensively available to a scientific community and can thus be indexed and linked to other images in a completely different way than, for example, illustrations and illustrated books. Thus, a delocalized processing is possible, which can also involve broad sections of the population in the acquisition of information, which is sufficiently referred to as crowdsourcing. In the third dimension of a virtual reality infrastructure, scientists worldwide can exchange information, for example, about certain medical phenomena and their modeling. Hopefully, it will not be long before historical phenomena can also be collaboratively investigated in this way. The in digital image therefore initially consists of digital code that takes shape as a bit sequence. The binary coded information then appears as light spots on the surface of the display. The digital image thus exists in two ways or in two forms, on the one hand as a visual phenomenon, 
on the surface and on the other hand as the digitally coded information on the subsurface, as Frieda Nake, the Bremen computer scientist and pioneer of computer art, calls it. For him, the digital image is therefore a double image. He had already pointed out in 2001 that digital signs are always interpreted in two ways, by the human being on the one hand, who sees the image on the surface, and by the computer on the other hand, which can change and transform them on the so-called subsurface, whereby the surface does not, does not know the possibility of manipulation. In defining the surface and the subsurface, Nake distinguishes two different levels of interpretation of how humans and computers deal with digital images. Let's take as an example two tools of common image editing programs to crop photos, that is, to define what is shown in the foreground and what belongs to the background. The magic band works on the subsurface and is used to interpret images algorithmically. One could say that the computer defines what to select as background based on thresholds between pixels with encoded information about color and brightness values. In contrast, the lasso allows the user to act on the image surface and select ob objects in the image by outlining them. So it is the user or his skill who decides what belongs to the background. Copying or deleting this manually made selection, however, is again the task of the algorithms acting on the subsurface. It is not inherent in the code to be interpreted as an image and displayed as such on the surface. The media logic of the image is grafted onto it from outside. It is the result of an imaging process. It is quite possible to reproduce the same visual information differently on the subsurface. Texts can, for example, be coded as a sequence of characters or as an arrangement of pixels. If the same image is stored in different image formats, these are converted differently into code in the subsurface, although they appear to the user as the same image on the screen surface. The same thing can also lead to different results in the mediation between the surface and the subsurface if, for example, it is not possible to distinguish between differently coded color tones because the color depth of the monitor is too low or because of a particular calibration. But even if the magic wand promises to identify image objects automatically, this tool still requires human action as the user has to specify with a mouse click which object should be selected. When using the lasso, the user selects image objects on the surface by framing the boundaries of the object, while the user of the magic wand must evaluate the result of the algor algorithmic selection of the image object and, if necessary, correct it by extending or narrowing the selection range. This makes it clear that at least in the context of digital media technologies, the surface and the subsurface of digital images tend to be decoupled from each other on the one hand, but on the other hand are mutually dependent. The criteria for the identity of images thus double in the field of digital media, whereby neither the visual phenomena on the surface nor the bit sequences in the depth of the computer can be given preference over the other side. However, this terminological distinction between surface and subsurface is not only useful for digital images, but can ultimately be applied to all digital products and processes implemented in the digital world, including the use of databases. Here too, information that is identically arranged on the subsurface can be visualized differently on the surface depending on the query and layout. After we have first dealt with scanning and the basics of computer graphics and then asked ourselves in general terms what the digital image actually is, what characteristic it has and what effects it has, we would like to pursue in the final third part of this lesson what consequences this has for the digital capture of images. Following on from the second lesson, I would like to present here above all the advantages and disadvantages of text and image-oriented digitization. Digital images are often made available as scans in online databases. This still completely analog form of acquisition and presentation results from the slide libraries of institutes, museums, archives and agencies which were digitized in the 2000s. The photos and slides are also labeled and sorted according to predefined categories.
A central task of these huge image collections is their searchability, which is why keywording is just as important as the subdivision of the information according to search criteria such as artist, place of production, title, dating, epoch, location, etc. Such image pools and research databases are not only available in art history, but also in archaeology, for example. The digitization of large image collections had already begun in isolated cases in the 1970s. With the spread of the Internet, higher resolution screens were, made, were able to make scanned images accessible worldwide. Today, the then very impressive online collections of the Art Renewal Center, the Web Gallery of Art and others seem a bit tired. With their text-oriented acquisition in simple database structures, these pioneers set the standard for many other repositories that are still current today, such as the online compilation of collection highlights or even the inventory catalogues of larger museums. Gradually, the networking of the data stocks also moved into the focus of interest. An early good practice example is the British Museum, which has made its entire collection accessible online, linked it to authority records and linked open data, and made it externally linkable to other databases. Indeed, there is a semantic web version that makes the British Museum collection data available in the W3C open standard RDF, connects to and refers to a growing number of linked data published worldwide. Authority records stored in Thedauri, highlighted in red on the website, guarantees a standardized exchange of data. The photos of the collection objects, which fortunately can be enlarged, are only of illustrative character here. Even though in the case of two similar collection objects, the described object can only be clearly identified by the illustration. Controlled vocabularies are indispensable for keywording, cataloging and describing the themes of images represented in works of art, reproductions, photographs and other sources. Associated ontologies in which classes of terms are defined and the relationship of these classes to each other are also described ensure that information can be read and also evaluated across the various databases. Icon class, for example, contains... Uh, 28,000 hierarchically ordered definitions divided into 10 main sections. Each definition consists of an alphanumeric classification code and the description of the iconographic motive that identifies the classification. This text-oriented system of capturing the content of images was significantly driven by librarians, while the pictorial sciences out of the justified concern about oversimplification, raised concerns about the outset, which, however, seem to me, even in the absence of any tangible alternatives, have now been silenced. Linked open data was long considered the most promising promise of a semantic arrangement and penetration of humanity's content. Especially archaeologists, who always find and evaluate the same types of material on the excavations, became interested very early on in a standardized description of findings. A relatively new example is Keramekos.org, a joint project that provides an ontology of ceramics data, although this is currently still limited to Greek black and red figure ceramics. There, for example, the following RDF data are provided for the Attic Potter Exequias. Started with the naming of XML version and the encoding, the various namespaces or XML namespaces used here are first identified. The way they work could be compared in a certain way to prefixes for telephone numbers, which provide a deal-in node or, in this case, a linguistic frame of reference for all subsequent entities. For the indication of the place, namespaces must then also be determined before one can go to the geographical name Attica. Attica is defined here in a SCOS score. The SCOS score, or Simple Knowledge Organization System Core, is an RDF scheme for representing Thesauri and similar types of knowledge organization systems. SCOS core can be used to port existing knowledge organization systems to the semantic web or, as here, to create simple concept schemes for a semantic web from scratch. In our case, the resource Attica is assigned preferred labels in the different languages and spellings and a, defin and a definition 
Attica is a historical region that encompasses the city of Athens, the capital of Greece, exact match also refers to other already existing ontologies and thesauri. In the same way, other concepts linked to exequias, such as black figure, are then defined. And then the name of the Greek vase painter and potter. The establishment of such an ontology means that the vase painters, their style and place of production can be adequately re referenced in databases and on the Internet, regardless of the input language. For example, if one searches for black figure vases from Essence, this ontology can also be used to display pictures which have been marked only with the name Exequias. Thus, indexing and searching in the image meta search is done via metadata such as keywords or links. The images and objects themselves are thus understood as and interpreted, detached from their appearance, as a bag of words. There it is no question that such a procedure can be useful, but it hardly does justice to the specific character of pictures. Moreover, the text-oriented acquisition of pictorial works is time-consuming, despite all the ontologies available. On the other hand, this is in contrast to image-oriented acquisition, which can also only refer to formal criteria, namely visually unambiguous characteristics such as color, texture or forms. Content-based image retrieval uses computer vision techniques to search an image database for the most visually similar images to a specific query image. This procedure works relatively well when searching for identical images, possibly in different image sizes. As you can try out for yourself at TinICOM, excellent results can be achieved here. For example, if you download a photo a few months ago and now you don't remember on which page you came across the image. The multicolored search is also interesting. Here you can select four colors and enter their ratio to each other in percent and from the amount of all photos uploaded to Flickr you will get all images that have the desired color distribution. The methods considered so far have not annotated the images in the image itself but have external indexed the respective image files and databases or enriched them internally with metadata. Automatic image annotation proceeds differently. Here, methods of pattern recognition and machine learning are used to automatically assign metadata to digital images in the form of subtitles or keywords automatically, using extracted feature vectors and training annotations to automatically apply annotations to new images. It is thus a kind of classification for several, in fact many classes, using relevance models to match the text vocabulary within, within the visual vocabulary. The basis for automatic image recognition is the annotation of images in training sets. Similar to text annotation, the respective areas of the image can be marked and provided with meaning. Such procedures are used, for example, in auto autonomous driving, where lines, in this case the road boundaries, are marked or moving cars are outlined as cubes. These markings are used to train neural networks on large image data sets to recognize these areas automatically in the image data. In the field of image science, rather bounding boxes and full segmentation are used. In the one case, the image objects to be recognized are knotted or surrounded by a line. In the image file, the pixels selected in this way are then stored as a cluster and marked. More time-consuming but pixel exact is the segmentation of the image into its image components, which are marked in different colors and annotated with a term. You will get to know these two methods in the coming semesters. First of all, we would like to refer you to various annotation tools as far as they are compiled at Wikipedia. The VGG image annotator is easy to use. It was developed at the Un Oxford University mainly for the annotation of objects and films. If the objects are easily detached from the background, you only need to roughly bypass them. The user then selects the appropriate term, in this case sworn, from a list previously created by the user. This tool also contains the possibility to indicate the recognizability of the object in the picture. This is important, for example, when overlaps obscure the outer contour. 
As you can see here, the area annotation with bounding boxes or with outer contours also works very well with Greek vase paintings. To name another annotation tool, the Open Image Annotation Viewer is a web-based tool with which a high-resolution image can be saved and annotated. This tool allows multiple graphical annotations in the form of a line, a circle, a rectangle and by means of a color palette. You can also enter text and save it as metadata in the image file. The MATLAB Computer Vision Toolbox, which is not free of charge, is very convenient. It integrates image processing functions so that even full segmentation does not take too much time. If you combine all these methods, you get a very powerful tool. Here on the slide you can see a prototype with which I evaluated the board game scenes on Attic Vases as a first test case. Even though in a few years we will have established methods that can classify images quite accurately, there will still be categories that are not an inherent part of the picture and therefore can't be extracted from the visual appearance. These include proper names like Parthenon or semantic categories like Temple of the Acropolis at Athens. The advantage of automatic image annotation over content-based image retrieval is therefore that queries can be entered textually. However, in ignorance of the trends data, the results returned by the Google Images search are not always comprehensible and therefore hardly usable scientifically. I liked Pixelution Org better, where you could enter a search term for an uploaded image in the similarity search and also had the possibility to weight the ratio of the two queries in percent. In 2016, the result with a 90% match was still very much dependent on the color distribution, so that, for example, the Erechtheion, the Hadrian's Gate and the Church were also among the results. Unfortunately, the service is now subject to a fee, which is understandable in some ways, because collecting and maintaining the necessary image sets is very time-consuming and expensive. For the same reason, 2080 Incognacom had to shut down for its service due to data mining attacks and is now only available on request. Finally, I would like to point out the similarity search we are most changed at Tinai. For the Mona Lisa, there is a quite funny result without me wanting to go into the basic problem of the similarity determination today. It is indeed a central problem of digital image and artifact science. As a result of the past three lessons, I would like to conclude with a discussion of the methods of digitization. One standard of text-based acquisition of cultural property is the annotation of image data. Controlled vocabularies, taxonomies and ontologies are used here, that is, expensive expert knowledge is used to digitize the image and objects. The advantages are obvious. As a result, the digitized images with their meta and para data are very precise and highly structured, schema consistent and also transparent with regard to the acquisition method and its result. The annotation of images is therefore well suited for small amounts of data with many dimensions of meaning. Unfortunately, the procedure is expensive because it involves high personal costs and time consuming because it cannot be automated. But it also depends on the perception of the people doing the acquisition, in the lucky case of relevant experts, but often also of student beginners in the field. Since the procedure is comp comparatively slow, it is not well suited for large amounts of data. All image archives know the difficulty of being able to annotate large quantities of images in a manageable time. Crowdsourcing methods could be of help, in which lay people are motivated in some way to contribute suitable parts of the annotation. This is particularly successful if a personal connection exists or can be established, in the case of data on the history of the hometown, for example, or popular works of art. This is where the game Artigo, which was developed in 2010, comes in and anyone can join in. Users are presented with digital reproductions of work of art for which they have to enter keywords. In the process, they compete for a limited time against a virtual competitor whom they have to outdo. In 10 years, 90 million annotations to some 80,000 pictures have been collected in this way. The images tagged in this way now not only facilitate the search in the Art Historical Image Database, but are also suitable for studies on the perception of artworks today.
Automated content indexing of images is possible by means of pattern recognition. Statistical and probabilistic models such as data mining, image analysis, natural language processing, etc. are used here. This process can be automated and leads to useful results quickly and cheaply. Therefore, it is also well suited for large amounts of data. Conceptual consistency of the acquisition over the entire process is guaranteed and the results can be reproduced at any time. One of the main problems of image recognition is its lack of transparency. What exactly the neural network used in deep learning methods do is difficult in can discern and can only be inferred from the results. Semantic depth is also a problem. Image similarity search can only detect correlations between images, but not generate causality. So far, therefore, pattern recognition is really only suitable for very large amounts of data, especially since most neural networks expect a uniform trans distribution of features. After all, in order to recognize one motive, countless ones are needed to learn beforehand. In summary, one can say that small amounts of data and qualitative analysis benefit from the annotation method, while large amounts of images and corresponding qualitative elevations should e use image pattern recognition. However, the two procedures need by no means be mutually exclusive. After all, even with pattern recognition, the training data are first annotated. One study that uses both methods is, for example, the Passau Neoclassica project. CDOC CRM enriches an ontology for formalizing knowledge of art and architectural history with terms derived from contemporary sources. The controlled vocabulary is multilingual, including English, French and German. Deep learning and distribution semantics algorithms are also applied to image and text data. Automated object recognition searches museum photographs as well as contemporary drawings and engravings for the classified pieces in this case specific chair shapes, while text mining connects to terminology and descriptions. One can perhaps gauge from this how much the image and object sciences are now also benefiting from digital processes. This is especially the case when we are dealing with large, best structured image sets, which unfortunately are not yet generally available. So corpus building is still a very important thing. And to ensure that all efforts do not go to waste, they must remain compatible, which is best achieved with authority records. Which brings us to the challenges in dealing with the digital image. As you have seen today, the acquisition and indexing of images is still a central topic. The critical and reflective handling of visual phenomena and their fluidity has also become more topical now and must be examined again and again also from the social sciences. And last but not least, the theory of the digital image and the manifestations of the digital turn are also the subject of current research discussion and a priority program of the German Research Foundation. If you now ask what you should know after this lesson, it is first of all the basics of visualizing information. In addition, you should be able to name and distinguish the basic properties of graphics such as image size, resolution, color depth, color space, compression, transparency, layers, etc. The file formats for storing pictorial information and their differences are important in practice, especially for the question of which data format is best to choose. I had already talked about current positions on the concept of the image and its relevance for the humanities in the first lesson. Today it has been expanded by an important facet, namely that of the digital image. I demonstrated the possibilities of textual labeling and visual annotation of images at the end, which is important to any kind of digitization. But the relevance of metadata in and to image files also makes up an important part of this. This results in the requirements for what you should be able to do in the future. On the one hand, you should be able to select suitable graphic formats for different usage scenarios and long-term archiving. On the other hand, you should be familiar with an image editing program and be able to edit digital images that is sizing, manipulation, cropping, working with multiple layers and suitable saving. But also the use of automatic batch processing for similar process steps is something I would expect from you. 
<coughs> in the exam, there will be a first part where mainly terminological questions arise. Here I could ask, for example, what is meant by image size in computer graphics. This is followed by more extensive questions, which you should answer with more than one sentence. After today's session, I could ask, for example, what is a digital image, what properties does it have, and what are its implications. A shorter question could be, which file format would you use for a printed publication, which for an image database? And, of course, you have to justify your answer. Or I could ask, what possibilities for image-based data search do you know? More essayistic, and thus located in the third past, are questions like, what is the iconic turn? What part does a computer play in this development? And I will also ask you for your opinion. For example, what difference do you see between text and image data? It goes without saying that you will have to justify your assessment here as well. For more in-depth information, here are again some textbooks and an article that I recommend. And with that, I bid you farewell and wish you a good week.